All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Glad to have you all with us today on this Monday. Hope that you're having a good semester um, so far. And uh, this afternoon it is again our Society of Agriculture Communication Scholars monthly webinar. And today we have with us Kara Lawson at Oregon State University, who's going to be talking about advice for future agricultural communications journalists. And as those of you who've been a part of this for, for quite some time, uh, we have a presentation discussion followed by time for question and answer, or if you just want to kind of pop in if there's a specific question that you have, I'm just going to speak for Kara right now and say, hey, if you have something just dying, you got to say, feel free to do so. Uh, otherwise, hold your questions or put them in the chat and we'll get to those at the end of the, of the presentation. And then after uh, a time of discussing among all of us uh, about what, what the, the presentation is about, we'll have some time to just talk about stuff in general. So if you have uh, positions, uh, announcements, or things that are going on at your university that you'd like to share, please feel free to share that as well. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. Okay, thanks so much, Dr. Telg, and thanks to everyone for joining today, whether you're on spring break or on a spring wellness, or if you're in classes, I appreciate you taking some time to join us today and um, kind of talk a little bit about an area that I'm really passionate about, and I know that many of us in agricultural communications are passionate about as well, and that is um, some information I've collected from agricultural communications journalists and their advice for future um, agricultural journalists for those entering the field. So I'll go ahead and jump right in. And I thought it was important to acknowledge as we get started that agricultural communications is so unique. And um, what makes it unique is the diversity in the discipline, right? So there is diversity in career paths. Um, from potential careers ranging from sales and marketing down to photography, graphic design, event planning, social media, lobbying, and even more than that. I'm sure if we were to um, really investigate this and kind of look at some of the work done in the past, we'd find even more careers that our graduates go into. At the same time, scholars in the past have identified a couple of areas of needed skills. Uh, Morgan and Rucker identified some things such as good writing, critical thinking, grammar, ability to use information sources, as well as the recent study commissioned by the APLU, where they found that listening was a needed skill set, along with building relationships and analyzing problems. And Kelsey Hall talked about this last fall in one of our sessions. And then finally, um, kind of the third leg of this is the course offerings. And there is a variety in terms of what's offered in agricultural communications programs around the country. But Cannon and her colleagues, um, Drs. Buck and Speck, found that writing courses, introductions to AgCom courses, and internship courses were really common. So I bring this up to kind of lay the groundwork to tell you that what I found in this component of my study is really kind of nothing new that we um, haven't already talked about or investigated or pointed out in the past. Instead, it's really part of an ongoing conversation about what specifically journalism and agricultural communities communications can be and what it needs. Um, so what I'm hoping to do today is to provide a bit of nuance upon this subject and share some of the feedback that I collected um, last fall for my dissertation. So we're just going to kind of talk about this one kind of specific element of agricultural communications and what people from the industry had to say. So before we get started, I know that this is a topic that many of you are really familiar with. So if you could, I'd appreciate if you would just be willing to share what you think it takes to be a successful journalist in agriculture communication. So if you wanna think about that question and share your thoughts before we get started even further. I actually was able to go to a webinar, I think it was an ACE webinar recently, and I love that they said a successful journalist needs to be a good listener and a good storyteller. So that's been on my mind lately. Okay. You may see some familiar terms with that as we move on, Kenna. Thank you. Hey, Kara. Hi. Um, I would add to those, those are really great traits. I would say another thing is curiosity. Mm -hmm. uh, exploring new and unique topics or just knowing how to ask the right questions to get to information your readers want to know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Thanks, Courtney. 
backbone. Um, sometimes it's really hard to do stories that, uh, you know, maybe it's your friend, a company your friend works for, or a company that advertises with you, um, mm -hmm. and the story might not be so positive. It's, it's hard to do those types of things. So it, it takes a lot of guts to be a successful journalist. Oh yeah, definitely. All of those things are so important to being a good journalist. It's, it's so much more than just being a good writer, right? I mean, that's so important, but really there are different skills and characteristics that really make for being a successful journalist in not only agricultural communications, but in general. Um, those are all really good. Does anyone have anything else that they'd like to share before I move on? Oh, this is Heather. I just was gonna say, Dr. Evans always used to tell us that we needed to be able to write well, take mm -hmm. a good picture, and be able to interview people through active listening skills mm -hmm. because if you cannot do those probing questions and you just run through your questions like students like to do instead of listening to what someone said and that they probably answered four of the questions you had later on that you'll look like you know you don't know what you're talking about so using those active listening skills during the interview process is important mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Heather. Yeah, I think that as I move forward, you're going to see a lot of similarities and that it sounds like we in the discipline and some of those in the field may be on the same page quite a bit. So let's go ahead and move forward. And certainly if you have other ideas, please feel free to go ahead and chat them in. But before I share the results, I wanted to share with you a little bit of context. The data that I'm going to present to you today were collected um, involving a really unique situation. Um, so for my dissertation, I did a case study on the farm and dairy newspapers coverage of opioid addiction in rural areas. So the participants in this study were three journalists and the editor of the series. So the questions were kind of rooted in this very unfamiliar topic and a rural newspapers, a farm publications, um, willingness, ambition, drive, motive to cover this unfamiliar topic. So these questions weren't asked just kind of in a general sense, but I wanted to give you a little bit of context um, because that might help to explain the results a little bit. And also, you know, this kind of series, a 15 feature series, a major social media campaign, web component, this isn't something that journalists take on every day. Um, this isn't something that regular journalists take on every day. It's not something that agricultural communications journalists certainly do every day either. This was um, for the editor who had worked there um, for 30 years. It was a once in a career kind of thing for her. Um, and for journalists, it was something that they had never really done before. So the scope was major. And I wanted to put that out there um, because while the results I think can be applicable to any situation in journalism, um, or in reporting, there was a little bit of context here that I thought was important to share. So on the right, those are some of the images that were on their website, just to kind of give you a little bit of information, but it was a major investigative journalism undertaking. Um, so in addition to that whole case study, I asked them a variety of questions about their motivations for putting that report together, but I also asked them, what advice do you have for future journalists? And this was something that was a little bit too much to unpack in my dissertation, so it didn't make it in, um, but I felt like it still had a lot of really valuable insights and items that needed to be shared. Um, so that's why I'm sharing it today. But on this question for those four participants that I asked, four themes emerged regarding advice for future journalism. Um, so in no, in no particular order, the first major piece of advice they had was to recognize and manage bias. And the editor said, ag publications want to be friends. We want to be those cheerleaders. And sometimes we have to address the bad news. And I thought this quote was particularly telling because she also talked to me a little bit about her concern of advocating. And she recognized that it was really great to see much, so much enthusiasm coming from students in agcom programs. But she just felt that sometimes that enthusiasm was just a little bit too much. It kind of clouded judgment at times, um, which kind of gets into the next statement that I paraphrased, 
paraphrase from one of the reporters was just to make sure not to convey your own preconceived or ill-conceived or misconceived ideas. And just the importance of recognizing your own bias before you try to write from an unbiased standpoint. And we charge our students to write from an unbiased standpoint all the time, but when they are naturally so passionate about a topic, those biases can sometimes cloud that judgment. And throughout this series, the reporters talked to me about how they noticed their biases creeping in a lot and the importance of their team to help them keep those in check. So um, just kind of thinking from the terms of we're creating, we want to create advocates for the industry, but we don't want them to be so kind of one-sided that it prevents them from telling sometimes the bad news in the industry. Um, like Dr. Earlbeck said, sometimes you just have to have a backbone and go against things that you don't necessarily, that you're not necessarily pleased about or things that are hard. Um, and then finally, one of the journalists also said, it's important to just publish what they, meaning the source say, and sometimes your opinions of what you hear, smell, think, and feel are not appropriate. Um, and you know, the roots for this kind of, I guess, um, tendency to write from a one-sided or almost argumentative standpoint could go back to high school. I mean, students are charged to pick a side and go for it, but sometimes in agricultural communications, we've just got to be more objective. So first, recognize and manage bias. Kara, can I hop in here real quick? Yeah, I was just looking at your chat, please. Yeah, one of the, one of the things that you, and this has never clicked, even though I read your dissertation, <laughs> is this idea of um, having students completed in bi or implicit bias. And I know that's more about interpersonal interactions, mm -hmm. but it may help students start to recognize. And your point about advocating is really, I think, important. We have developed an advocating for agriculture course Mm -hmm. But we need to draw a line and show them like where objective and subjective content, where it's appropriate and where it's not. And um, so that, I, if anything, that was a kind of a light bulb moment. I'm not sure where that would fit in or the best place to put it, but I know I've struggled in my writing class and helping students understand the difference between objective and subjective statements. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you've taught that class, so you know too. Um, they really want to put in their own opinions. And I'm like, yeah. you're, you're entitled to them, but not yes. in this project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so hard. And I've run into that in my very limited teaching experience already. So I would love to try to get that under control. Um, but yeah, I mean, students are passionate. So when you're passionate about something, I think that's going to obviously shape the way you view the issue, right? And it's so hard to step back and look at something that you've already developed in an opinion on you have strong foundations or values surrounding it it's so so tough and even at oregon state some of our classes are even titled advocacy for agriculture and natural resources and it's not a bad thing um it just really needs to be more carefully approached i think um so yeah no point point well taken um heather did you want to speak to your comment a little bit too Oh, I was just saying I to to piggyback on what you were you guys were both just saying I just stress I tend to stress in our in our second level writing class. Um, the product that they're putting out are they are they doing a personal blog and and I use a lot of since um, Holly Spangler is the editor for Prairie Farmer magazine here in in one of our alums she comes and talks to them a lot about she has her own personal blog, yet mm -hmm. she also writes you know, factual information for the Prairie Farmer Magazine and Farm Progress Show. And so we look at the two differences and we try to, to use examples because they tend to do better with examples than just saying, okay, you know, if you're going to write on a, you know, for bear on a social media mm -hmm. post, obviously that's not your opinion or whatever. So you, it, we show a lot of examples and that's mm -hmm. been helpful to kind of get them to understand where opinion falls out or falls into place and where you should not. So that's just how we've done it to try to help because we have a lot of advocates as well. So yeah. 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 Perfect. Thanks so much for sharing. And thanks for everyone who's chatting in. Um, I find that it, it's so hard when 
we ask them to describe a controversial issue. So, you know, issues in agriculture and natural resources do tend to be controversial. So it's really hard for them to tell both sides of the story, it seems. Um, so keep chatting in. I'm gonna check the time. For sake of time, I'm gonna move on to the next one. Um, you're gonna you're gonna love these. So the next theme that emerged was the need to embrace research and investigation. Um, so we talked a lot about this because, again, thinking about the context, I was asking these questions. The reporters and the editor had done a lot of data analysis from the CDC, from the USDA. There was a lot of data that went behind this issue. But the editor in general said regarding data analysis and interpretation that it's a skill set that she wished every journalist had. And she actually talked a little bit about um, having her journalist and herself enroll in an online data journalism class. She said it didn't go quite the way she, it was hoping though. Um, and I'm not sure, I didn't ask any follow-up questions to that unfortunately, but just wanted to point out the, the need for that and that when they started this major project, that was a skill set that all of them were lacking. They all talked about needing to hone in on their research skills and really do their homework. Um, another suggestion was to attend conferences and continue that education process. And especially if you're covering a topic um, that kind of has some steam to it and it's a big situation, there are conferences where you can talk about these kinds of things with other, other journalists, other people reporting on the issue. And then just being open to these unfamiliar situations and situations and issues that might sound intimidating. One of the journalists said, don't put up a wall right away. Don't say, I don't know anything about this. I don't want to touch this. Who's had that feeling before? All of us. None of us super love ambiguity and super really just want to jump into something that we are not familiar with. Um, but the journal said, give it a shot, take some time to do your research and homework on the topic. And I think this is one of the things that we can help our students to grow in as well, just to make them more open to investigating and realizing that you don't know everything about a topic. New things are going to come up, um, especially with the nature of science, agriculture, and natural resources. And then finally, one of the journalists just said, be open to the experience of learning something new. So um, there was definitely kind of reverberating message about just the need to, to take the time to learn and be okay not knowing everything. Um, yes, I'm, the chat is, is really good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop looking at the chat because it's distracting me. But if you, got, if you have something to say, please, please do speak up. Did anyone have anything that you'd like to add on, on this theme? But I, would, I just wrote that even if they don't become a journalist, being able to do these things are really important. I'm thinking about some of my former students who work in sales mm -hmm. and they need to be able to investigate and research demand for a product and who would be the ideal target for that public and how do they grow market share and how do they, you know, all of those things. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the, the experience of learning something new. I mean, we, we hope that our students become lifelong learners and that mm -hmm. they continue to seek knowledge and problem solve and make good decisions and pay taxes. And yes. you know, <laughs> that, so I think that it's, it's helpful for students, like even if you're not going to be a journalist, these are fundamental skills. Um, yeah, that we, you know, we hope that you're you'll grow, you'll be able to develop as you write, right? If you get some pushback from students who are like, well, I'm not a good writer. Mm -hmm. Well, that may, you know, that may be the case today, but if you can do these things, you'll be a better writer tomorrow. Yeah, 100%. I agree. These skills are universal, you know, regardless of the path that is taken. Um, so it was definitely something that showed up across the board from, from all the interviewees. Okay, here's the next one. So next was to work to connect and build trust with sources. And to illustrate this, um, they talked about just the need to find the right source and not necessarily going for the low hanging fruit or the easiest person that they could talk to. They talked about the importance of really getting out in the community and seeing what was on the minds of the people experiencing the issue. 
Um, a lot of them talked about cultivating their relationship as well and said things such as it takes a lot of trust for a source to open up to a reporter. We have to gain trust and rapport. Um, additionally, they have to respect you. And if they don't, you're not going to go anywhere. And then finally, you just really have to build relationships and slowly get information. And kind of building from this is the need to create a comfortable environment for the source or the informant. Um, one of the journalists told me it's important to make the source feel comfortable and have a conversation. And then if you need facts later, you can come back and ask again, but just don't start right off the bat with hard questions about facts. It's just not going to go anywhere. So just and we teach this a lot, um, how to interview, but I really wonder if there are better ways that we can teach trust building and connection building, because that was something um, that they all kind of struggled with, especially for this story. Um, I think that most of the journalists said that they were comfortable talking with farmers and some of their traditional sources, but for an issue like they were covering here, a, a drug epidemic, they were really kind of geeked out about talking to addiction counselors or, you know, struggling um, users. So it was really hard for them to figure out how to do that. Um, so I think there is potential for us to, to help our students grow in this skill set as well. Um, Sarah, oh, sorry. It's okay. If we have time, do we have time? Yeah, I think so. So one of the, and Heather already answered role playing, but one of the things that, um, it, good or bad, I just wonder how our recent reliance and need to use virtual learning uh, for our students will benefit, but also maybe harm their ability to go out and contact sources. I think um, I've seen that from a few students who were very hesitant to go like visit with people in real life and ask them questions. And while I think your idea about trust building and um, connection building could be really useful, and also, you know, how do we leverage Zoom? You know, how do we leverage getting students to just pick up a phone and call someone? Don't rely on text, don't rely on them to reply to an email first. Um, so I think it's just something to consider as we shift, especially these students who are going to be coming up in our programs over the next few years. Yeah, absolutely. And some of the one of the journalists in particular mentioned that Zoom was OK. And, you know, it was important to just try to do something and not just look for secondary sources. I think really what they were getting at was trying to find the best primary source that you could. And sometimes that does take going out out into the world. Um, that being said, some newspapers don't have the resources that allow for that luxury. So it's not always possible. Um, but I think just for issue, for talking about issues that are controversial or maybe a little bit emotional, you've, you've got to build that trust. And maybe it's not something um, you know, that you gain for just one news story. But if you're doing a feature story ever, certainly I think and maybe going back to the same source time and time again, building that trust is just is really important. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for all of your comments. Um, anything else before I sh move on to the last theme? Drum roll. I just have a really just quick gonna, comment. Sorry. Okay, sorry. Yeah, sure. Um, so I, um, at that same webinar, actually, they were talking about reaching out to diverse sources. And this is something that I've been really trying to focus on with my students, because I notice when they have to write a news article, they always gravitate to people like them, right? That's just mm -hmm. who is in their circle, who's easy to contact. And so when we're working to connect and build trust with sources, like you said, we need to seek out the right sources. And sometimes those people are different than who we are. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that takes time. And sometimes that means that we can't just text them. Like Courtney said, we need to, you know, mm -hmm. go out and meet them on their field. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 100%. 100%. Thanks, Ken. And that was something that they ran into in this particular situation as well. Um, Dr. Erlbeck, did you, did you have something too? I was just going to give a huge round of applause shout out to the publication that did this because this took a lot of time to do and there's so much a lot of times there's just not budget to do something mm -hmm. like this so you know from from reading your dissertation like they set aside some time every week every day to to accomplish this and took the time that they needed rather than slapping something together and that's a huge 
um, is big sacrifice on their part. And, uh, and it worked out. I, I felt like it worked out really well for them to do that. So it's a good lesson for all of us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you for, thank you for that. It, it was, it was huge. It was a huge, I think eight month long undertaking. It wasn't just a, a week long thing. A dry, it wasn't just a drive by story. It was very in depth. Um, so again, journalists won't do this kind of thing all the time, but the things will move for the things and the lessons are important regardless. So the last theme that emerged was to tell a good story. So I thought it was cool when, when I think Kenna mentioned that at the very beginning or, or one of you to tell the good story. And for this, they just talked about the need to take notice and pay attention to what's happening. Um, the issue that they covered in this situation wasn't something that rural communities were really acknowledging at the time. Um, but one of the reporters told me if an issue is happening in an urban area, it's probably happening in a rural area as well. And so many of the good stories come from those issues that really aren't on anyone's radar yet. And not that they need you need to write for shock value, but you need to bring attention to things that are happening that may just not be acknowledged. Um, the second kind of sub theme here was to make it personal, and a lot of them talked about the need to put a face with an issue. Um, again, for this, when you can put a face with an experience um, with a situation that has a bad stigma, it lets others know that it can happen to anyone. So again, kind of a unique element of this study, um, but overall, you can't write about big stories without having it be about people. So the need to make it personal. And then also the need to combine data and personal stories to bring that story to life. They talked a lot about how the data kind of illustrated the magnitude of the issue, but the personal stories and the narratives really kind of brought the issue to life and put faces behind the numbers. So you need both. Um, You need that powerful narrative, but then you also need to understand the data so that you can explain the situation and what is going on. And then finally, I think this kind of goes along with our our little theme of just having a backbone. One of the more senior journalists said, be daring to explore the whole realm of the human experience. And I just thought that was really powerful because how often do stories just kind of go surface level? Um, And while they definitely have a place in, in the news and in the media, to tell a really good story, you need to be open to exploring the whole realm of the experience. So that was that was kind of powerful when I heard that. So those are the four themes. And in a nutshell, according to this study and what was uncovered, tell a good story is really what we're getting at here, right? Telling a good story is what we want journalists to do. And to do this, recognize and manage bias, embrace researching and investigating, and then finally making connections and building trust. And all of those really feed into telling a good story. And that is the task of a journalist. So as we move forward, we want to prepare our students to be better journalists, should that be the path they they choose. So where do we go from here? So the first theme involving helping students to manage and recognize bias. This isn't anything that is new. We know that this is an issue our students struggle with. um, And there have certainly been great articles that give some tips on this. So we talked about this a little bit. Um, What are some ways you do this in your classroom? You shared some good ideas already. Did anyone have um, any other ideas on what we could do um, that we haven't already talked about? We kind of got into it a little bit during that discussion. We do an issues audit as one of our assignments, a semester long assignment. And as part of interviewing, they have to interview two people that are either that are or two organizations slash people that are for and two people that are against their position. So they have to learn about their varying viewpoints. Mm -hmm. Um, I had one girl that did something on gestation crates and hogs, and she actually interviewed the lawyer for PETA. Wow. And she said she was very surprised how kind he was and how open he was to listening to what she had to say. And she said it was an amazing experience. And I, so I think I use that example with other students of don't be afraid of the opposing viewpoint because you may learn something that is unexpected. So mm-hmm. it, it turned out really well, actually. 
Yeah. Thank you, Heather. That is such a great idea because I think so often the default is to send students off to find credible sources for the opposing view um, and, you know, kind of the more favorable view. So just actually talking to someone who represents opposing views, I think is so powerful. That's a great idea. Did, did they all have to find their own sources? Yes, if they if they didn't know people, I would help them brainstorm or use mm -hmm. my network to help them find people, um, mm -hmm. which which oftentimes I would have to do because they had to do four. So a lot of times they'll find three and they'll be stuck on a fourth one. So, mm -hmm. uh, but you are right. I mean, we we stress the credible sources um, that they had to be a you know uh, they need to do a background on them and understand them, and then they had to develop at least ten questions to ask each interviewee, and they had to be. I mean, they could be some similar, but some different, obviously, if you're going to go from view from positive uh, viewpoint to a, a opposing viewpoint. And then they also could do a neutral one if they wanted to for extra credit. So, um, but that was how we got them to understand that, you know, it's not so scary and that it's important. Otherwise, you can't, I mean, that's an issues audit, which is a little different than being a journalist, journalist but then we applied it to those interviewing skills to feature stories, editorials, et cetera. So. Yeah, definitely. Thanks so much for sharing. That's a really cool idea. Um, anybody else have ideas on how you could help students to manage and recognize bias by making good use of your classroom time? I have an interesting comment that kind of taps into what Dr. Myers mentioned earlier about having students um, do an implicit bias test. We do this in one of our leadership courses here at Oregon State, um, Dr. Jonathan Velez personal leadership course, and he has them do an implicit bias, bias test and students hate it. They're very upset afterwards. They get so angry. And so I think it's important to do, but I think you really have to contextualize it for them and really set it up why this is important, why it's okay. We all have biases, but why we need to be aware of them. So they always submit in their comments, I never want to do an assignment like this again. This is the only one we have in this course. So I think it's really important to provide context for our students. It's important for them to do and recognize, but we really realize that that course, we have to set them up really nicely up front because they they're so surprised that they have some biases yes it, it's shocking thank you lauren yeah and i don't think that this is something that you can teach just in a one and done lecture i think it's up to us to continually promote um, bias recognition and bias management in, in all we do and hopefully that'll help them to be better prepared for um, for their careers I have more trouble with my students from that come from farms mm -hmm. than those because I had a lot of Chicago students in my class mm -hmm. here in Illinois, mm -hmm. and those kids don't they don't come with the ag bias. Yeah, they don't know anything about ag, so mm -hmm. it's um, they have to actually learn the science first, um, and so they kind of come in with almost an advantage. Yeah, it's, it's sometimes even a little bit easier to teach. When, when they don't have those filters already, but they do have them. Dr. Dorfert? Well, I think we should look at some of the other uh, disciplines that prepare professionals and they use role play a, mm -hmm. a great deal. Um, there is nothing that would prevent us from doing something where we could put a number of different perspectives in a hat per se and you draw one out and you have to role play that perspective. And then someone is a journalist having to interview them at that time. And we could talk about mm -hmm. what happened and is it accurate or do we miss some things and get them to diagnose as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great idea. And I love that. I think that role play is one of the, the best ways to learn. Perfect. Okay, lots of good ideas. So, Considering the development of research skills, um, what it, we have research methods in agricultural education. Is there a need for agricultural communications research courses? There aren't a lot of research courses in the discipline right now. Um, there is an opportunity to strengthen critical thinking with research and the opportunity to really promote 
analyzing information and not just finding it. So thinking about maybe just the potential for a full on research course in agricultural communication, what could this look like or what should it include? Or is it needed? Well, I had to take one as an undergrad at Kansas State. And I think for me, it was, you know, I'm like, oh, like birds, you know, like a duck to water. I'm like, here we go. But I think it really helps people understand from my experience in it, the role that, the power that communication can have. Um, Cause it was about evaluating media messages. And um, so I really enjoyed having that as an undergrad. I think selfishly, if we could do that for our undergraduate students, they would have a better expectation and be better prepared for graduate school, which many more of our students are indicating they want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't answer what it should look like or include, but I got some other ideas there too. No, no, that's okay. I mean, you're right though. It is, it is a great foundation for future graduate work. And, and just even, I, I really think that it could help them become better writers too, because they're going to be analyzing information and data a lot better with a new set of skills versus just going out into the world with, you know, free range, I guess. I don't know what to say. Um, Dr. Dorfert? Uh, we, we have this tendency every time we have a topic like this of what could we add? Uh, the challenge is most of us are limited in the number of credits and number of hours we can teach in an undergrad degree. So we need to ask then what needs to go away? Mm -hmm. uh, because if we're, we're doing something and maybe it's no longer value, then yes, research can replace it. But if all we're trying to do is cram more into the same box, the box is going to bust at the seams. And I would argue it's already doing that. Yeah, it kind of goes back to the first slide I presented that agricultural communications is so diverse in its course offerings, and we strive to provide our students with so many skills already, but it's hard to narrow that down. Dr. Telg? Yes, and somebody co-authored this that you're, you're citing on here. Uh, this was, this was done, you know, the research was done really in 2003, 2004, published in 2005, and uh, dating myself here a little bit, uh, that predates a lot of what we're talking about here of social media and, and all the other aspects of technology adoption and in, in, I mean, communication technology adoption in the last, you know, 15, 20 years or so. So uh, I, I echo what, what David has said is that, uh, when Tracy and I, you know, made these recommendations, I, I still stand behind them. It's just a matter of how do we do this? Uh, I think all of us are, uh, and many of you are, are brand new teaching in, in programs that you're establishing and trying to develop uh, a core curriculum that's going to work for, for you. Um, I, I think that having a research emphasis is important, probably today more so than ever before, as we talk about, you know, fake news this and fake news that and what's real, what's true, what's air quote true. Uh, uh, so I think we, we need to, to look at that, but it may be more of an integration into current courses rather than a, a separate course itself so that we're not, you know, bursting more at the seams with, with course content than we ever have before, because uh, I think we're all doing a lot of different things. So that's just me. So. If I can add on to that, Ricky, um, you know, a lot of the schools, the K-12 systems now are, are really trying to integrate digital literacy skills, data literacy skills into students so that they understand uh, what is good information via digital means. And, and the students we're getting are, are the digital natives. Ricky, you and I are not a digital native. Um, we're a little past that time. Maybe we need to approach this from a different point of view. Maybe we need to say, what are digital natives bringing to us? And how can we build upon that to make a mag journalist? Well, and I'll jump in on this one. I teach a unit on research in the campaigns course, and that's typically here. It's a course taken in their last spring semester. And at that point, they're ready. 
and uh, they, I'm, I'm in the process of grading the reports right now, and I'm pretty impressed with what they've done. And, um, you know, I kind of changed things a little bit this time around and started with qualitative research. And I'm like, this is just a, it's just, it's just a story, but really that's what it boils down to. It's a story where you've done interviews or focus groups and you boil that down into quotes and discern meaning from that. Um, and then we went into quantitative and you kind of do the same. There's a little more involvement, but you do the same thing. You're taking that data and telling a story with that data. And uh, you know, I've, they're, they're more interested than I sometimes think that they might be and they get it more so. So yeah, I totally agree with you, David. Like, what are we gonna cut if we add this to a curriculum? But they seem to be, it seems like the interest in it and the want to do a good job is uh, improving over the last few years. So I don't know if they're taking other courses elsewhere that's, uh, that's helping or if just they're they, they have so much access to information that they're learning how to discern that and boil it down and tell a story with it anyway. And then it just translates over into class. I, I don't know, but they're, they seem to be ready for and really liking this information now. Mm -hmm. That's exciting. And I think that is a great way to kind of start this. Maybe, I, I, and I totally agree. There is plenty of course offerings out there. Um, we don't need to just keep adding and adding and adding, but I do think we need to pay attention to these needs and integrate them probably into our courses like so many of you are doing already. I think that's really awesome. Um, and and I, I think this kind of gets to another point that employers and stakeholders are always going to have suggestions and they're always going to have needs and areas of improvement for us. Um, so I think it's important for us to keep in mind that, you know, maybe we can't address every single needed skill or issue or interpersonal need or whatever it may be. Um, so that's a conversation for another day, maybe like the role of not only the academy, but the role of industry and education as well. Um, so I think I think you're not going to like my last question. Let me see here. Um, so finally, strengthen skills and cultivating trust and building relationships. So a lot of the courses emphasize professionalism and interpersonal communication, but it still seems to be a struggle. Um, and that was kind of echoed in the APLU report as well. Um, so just are there any other ways we could help students practice building these skills and just ignore the second part of that question because I'm building a new program here with Lauren so I've got new course development on the brain so don't mind me. Um, but just thinking about how we can help students to feel more comfortable approaching sources who are unfamiliar and who are different. And, and again, I think, yeah, Heather totally agree role playing is, is a great start to that. Um, anything else anyone wants to, to add on, on this one? I, I guess I'm going to throw a question, Kara, back to you and Lauren then. Uh, the rest of us pretty much on this call are, are older programs, arguably 20, 20th century programs. You and Lauren are starting a 21st century program. Are you starting with a blank piece of paper with the knowledge you just shared with us, or are you copying the old programs? Um, it's a blend, a blended approach, I would say. It, um, so obviously looking to successful programs a lot, um, but also keeping in mind the needs of the students in our college and in our department are a little bit different than some of your programs. We encompass natural resources as part of our minor. Um, so with that, we have some different needs, but I would say we're taking a blended approach. We definitely have some ideas, but recognizing that every good ag comm program has a foundation of, of excellent courses. Lauren, did you wanna add anything on that? I think, I think that was a great answer. We really are looking at what would be good foundationally wise for them to build upon? What are those core skills that they need that a lot of your very established successful programs have? But um, Karen and I, we're not afraid to break the mold and we're looking at what we need to be doing now. We have assignments with TikTok that students love and not to say that all of you don't, but we're just trying to think present day now, 2021, 
where are we headed, where are we going, and how can we better prepare our students for today's social climate, um, environment, expectations, and technological advancements moving forward. So to, to echo off my pal here, very blended, but we're also trying to get an inventory of what, what do they absolutely need and what would be some great add on packages, values, focuses, routes that they could take that they could help personalize, whether they're into social media management, whether they're into photography, whatever that might be, and just trying to give our assignments different components that give present day examples, that give application for now and then moving into the future. But don't worry, we're we're definitely going to be reaching out to all of you as, as this develops. Dr. Myers. Well, I'm just proud of you both. Oh. <laughs> so, um, I, I was reading some of Kenna's comments and others. That's the great thing about chat on these is that we can just kind of drop in moments, that, you know, things that come to mind. And I I've seen a I've seen a trend in the past. Um, I have some students who are really, really anxious and nervous about visiting with others, even, even as Kenna noted in like a group project of speaking up in a group project or providing feedback to each other. And um, Jason Hedrick, one of our new faculty members, he was talking to me the other day about doing, um, he, I think it, he, I'm going to mess up how he described it. Basically, he does a lecture to help students understand the role that they play in each other's development and uh, the feedback process. And um, I, you know, in community building and he has that expertise. So I, I wanna visit with him more about how I can incorporate that in some of my coursework because when I went through college, it was like you edit each other's work to make it better. And now I think the perception is, well, why are you pointing out everything that's wrong? Um, and so it's trying, for me as an instructor trying to help, how do I reframe this? So it's not, I'm not trying to be critical. I'm trying to be constructive, but sometimes constructive criticism is necessary for you to grow and build. And um, this cultivating trust and building relationships also needs to happen with me and my class and um, not just my students. So I think I'm just telling myself, like I need to remember to keep that in mind. And by the time they're seniors and they know us really well, I feel like that's been established. Um, we, they, they know who we are. But those, my, my babies, they need a little more support. Um, mm -hmm. And Kara, you did a great job when you were here nurturing those when I would wound them. <laughs> well, thank you. You don't, I don't think you wound them. Um, but yeah, it's, it is so important. And I, I often get that vibe too, that my students are scared of me and I'm like, just, I'm just here to help. Um, but yeah, oh my gosh, so, so much that we can do. Um, and then, you know, ultimately all these kind of go back to telling a good story. Anything else, Dr. Dorfert, thinking about something? Well, I was thinking McDonald's rewards for keeping your orders right. If they want compliments, they should get a job at McDonald's. <laughs> well, I guess there's that too. Thank you for that comment. <laughs> Yeah, just finding a, a mix of, I, I think so many students are just so unsure of themselves. I, I get the feeling that they just don't have a lot of self-efficacy or self-esteem. So yeah, a lot of it is just trying to like build them up so hopefully they can take the criticism a little bit easier. Okay, Kenna? Yeah, I'm kind of going hand in hand with that. I've noticed a lot of students don't want to trust anyone else. Um, I. I made the mistake of, I do this semester long group project that's really just focused on communicating interpersonally and learning how to professionally communicate with your peers. And one semester I offered a chance, hey, if you're, if you really like, you have a schedule that just does not cater to this, let me know and we'll try to figure out what we can do for you. And in a class of 75, I probably had 30 people reach out and say, I wanna work alone. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, this clearly indicates that there's an issue because no one wants to work with each other. And so I don't know what the answer is. I don't really know how to help, but I do know that that is a problem. Yeah, definitely. I think that also comes from people being let down in a team mm -hmm. and they don't understand that the team moves forward. If somebody's a weak link, like I, I just finished a, a, a team project in um, my sales and persuasive communication class. And one team had a kid that didn't do their work. And I just said, the team moves forward with or without that individual, just like it would in the real world. Mm -hmm. So you have to learn to just navigate that. And here's how I would suggest it. 
Mm -hmm. And they're like, I didn't even think about the fact that we could move forward without him. Yeah. And I said, yeah. well, in the real world, you will have to because your boss will expect it. Mm -hmm. So, so I mean, it just, they were, they're like, oh, okay. And they, they just don't understand that stuff just doesn't stop. Yeah. Because we're not putting, you in a group, not putting you in a group to punish you or to be unfair. It actually is pretty important to learn to navigate right. those dynamics. I that was where I put groups. in about the leadership stuff is maybe mm -hmm. we need to have some groups and teams training mm -hmm. as part of incorporated in so that you can learn how to do that. Because even journalists have to work as part of groups and teams with a photographer or organizations. Oh, abs absolutely. And in, in fact, I think that is key to having to putting together a good piece. Um, a lot of the journalists in this study talked about the need to bounce ideas off of each other. Um, to touch base, ask questions. So the team is essential to good work. Um, a good team is essential to good work, I guess I should say. I got knocked on a teaching evaluation a couple of semesters ago. Dr. Erlbeck puts us in teams because she doesn't want to grade everybody's proposals. Mm. <laughs> no, no, no not, not exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so much that we can do. And I really appreciate everyone's great ideas and all of your good questions and feedback. Um, so that's all I have today. And I can't wait to look through the chat a little bit more and maybe follow up with you, some of you on some of these things, um, especially building a new program. This is definitely top of mind for me of skill building and addressing needs and just preparing our students to have as much success as possible. So if anyone ever has any questions for me or wants to reach out or, or collaborate, I've got my email address here. And I want to give a shout out to my awesome dissertation committee, Dr. Myers, Dr. Dr. Erlbeck, Dr. Boren, and Dr. McCord. Thanks so much for allowing me to conduct this research. And I feel better knowing that this little tidbit that didn't make it into that long document has now found kind of a home. So thank you so much. I appreciate everyone's awesome comments and questions today. Great. Thank you so much. Wonderful, wonderful discussion. You've actually uh, you brought up a topic that's near and dear to a lot of people's hearts. So I appreciate and compliment you on, on a great uh, presentation and, and content here for, for all of us. So thank you very much for that. Uh, we are almost at time. I do want to, uh, I think we've had, had our questions and discussion throughout. So if there are any uh, things that you would like to share with the group before we head out, anything at all, um, this would be the time to do so. Uh, there's I, a uh, I just resource up, there from Courtney. Yeah. Um, I just wrapped up a USDA funded grant. Um, Kara actually helped on this project, right? A little bit, yeah. Um, and so that this is a, um, a website that has links just to a fact sheet and then a, a short YouTube video about four unique or not unique, innovative communication research tools, dial testing, eye tracking, psychophys, and social media monitoring. So it's written for this e-extension crowd. Um, and so it's, I hope, written in a way that would be easily consumed if you wanted to introduce some of your master's students or even really talented undergrads, especially social media monitoring. Um, that's, that's there. So just wanted to share that resource. Great. Thank you very much for that. Um, any other resources, any other comments from folks? If not, remember next, next month, April 26th is our last uh, presentation for the academic year. We'll kick up again uh, in August or September, somewhere around that time frame for the fall semester. But on April 26th, uh, David will be uh, leading us on the topic thinking like a futurist and some of the things we've been uh, dealing with and talking about the last few months are going to be really brought out uh, in that presentation. So again, April 26, 3 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time. I'll be sending out more information about that, of course, over the next month. Uh, and uh, again, thank you so much for the presentation, Kara, and hope that everyone has a great end of March, 1st of April, and see each other again in one month. Thanks. Bye-bye.